invite Scott Centile to come come up to the pulpit. He is a Rama Training Center graduate, year of 1994. He attended Rama when Pastor James was attending Rama, and tonight he's got his wife who also went to Bible uh, Rama Bible Training Center, and uh, two of the four boys that that are. Uh, in attendance tonight in the service and so we want to welcome him and honor him tonight um why don't you pray? sure okay all right check check am i on all right okay let's pray with the offering all right father god in the name of jesus we just give these tithes and offerings unto you with a heart of joy and gratitude and worship Yes, God, worship, as Mr. Barber was praying or speaking about. The, the, we don't own it. We're just stewards, God. And so, Lord, as stewards, we recognize that you are our God. You are our source, and we trust in you, God. And we just thank you, Father God. We release them unto you. We release the blessing. Thank you, Father God. Your word says in Galatians 3.29, and if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So thank you, Father God. We release the blessing of Abraham on these tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Well, good evening, Oasis Church. Good it's a joy and an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight. I count it uh, with, a, with honor. So when Pastor James asked me, would you mind speaking for me tonight? Uh, I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Here. But tonight, you did not come here to see me. <laughs> I hope you didn't. <laughs> No, you came here tonight to see him, yes. right? So I would ask you, we're going to pray here in a second, but I ask you to look beyond this clay pot, look beyond this vessel here, right? And look to him, right? Open wide the eyes of your heart, okay? Open your heart, right? And listen for what he is saying. The Holy Spirit wants to speak a, a distinct, a special word tonight. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed doing this message. I've got like 10 pages of notes, <laughs> And I know we're not going to be able to cover that in the brief time that we have here. Um, the more I studied this subject, the deeper it just, it just kept growing and growing on the inside of me. And it was just awesome. It was just a blessing from the Lord. So we're not going to be able to cover it all tonight. <laughs> um, I feel like this is almost like a series. <laughs> but uh, praise God, we will honor the Lord and we will follow his direction tonight. Amen? Okay, so let's pray. Hallelujah, Father. We come in the name, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we've come here, Father God, with hearts expecting, expecting to see your glory, to see your goodness, to see you, Father God. Lord, we ask that you just give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the anointed one's anointing, at the eyes of our standing, being enlightened, flooded with light. Yes, we just make ourselves available to you. I ask that you anoint my mind, my eyes to see, and my mouth to speak. Father God, apart from you, I am nothing. In myself, I am nothing. In myself, I have nothing. In myself, I know nothing. In myself, I can do nothing. But I'm not by myself. I'm in Christ. Thank you, Father God. You may be a new creature in Christ. And tonight, Father God, I yield myself to you. I ask that you would use me, Lord, tonight as a mirror. Let me be a mirror of your, uh, to reflect the light of your love. Yes, Lord, your love being reflected. And Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of truth. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. We open ourselves up. Why? We open ourselves up to, to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, tonight, um, I've got two uh, scriptures here, uh, foundation scriptures, okay? So if you would turn with me to uh, James 1.21. James 1.21, and then 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Peter 1, 9. All right. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a message called The Salvation of the Soul. Salvation of the Soul. We're going to look at God's original design and his purpose in creating man in his own image and how in Christ we can be restored back to God's divine order by understanding and yielding to the process of of the salvation of the soul, okay? Everyone say with me, process. process. It's a process, <laughs> right? We start this journey of salvation 
By what? We ask Jesus to come into our heart. Say, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Come into my heart. And we start this journey on a road. We're in the starting blocks, and then we're, the gun sounds, and then we launch out, and now we begin the journey. So we begin salvation, and we're going to cover some of the basics here, lay a good foundation, and then we're going to look at the process of salvation of soul. What does that mean to have salvation of soul? And then how can we greater and more fully yield to the Holy Spirit? All right. James 1.21 Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness and craft a word which is able to save your souls. Let's say that. Able to save your souls. Okay? So the word itself has the power within it to save our souls, which implies right away, just look at that scripture, that our souls need to be saved. <laughs> they need it. Our souls need it. Especially in the world that we live in nowadays, we definitely need salvation of the soul. Amen? Okay, let's first lay a foundation for understanding God's original design when he created man as a tripart being, okay? First, God is a spirit, created man in the image of God. Now, I'm going to cover, you know, quite a few scriptures. Um, don't, turn to, don't turn to all these, okay? Just write down the references, okay? Um, and then um, I'll let you know which ones we want to focus on, but just, just write down the references for the sake of time, Okay? All right, so in John 4, 24, we see that God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then Genesis 1, 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him male and female. All right, so God created man in his image. What was this image look like? Well, Genesis 2, 7, God fashioned a body for the man and breathed his very essence, zoe, the God kind of life, into man. And then this is key right here. And the Lord God formed man, let's turn there, Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being or a living soul, another translation. I liken it this to, I, th I see an example of, how about a, a picture of a glove? You have a glove, one of those rubber gloves, right? And you're blowing into it, <laughs> and it gets really big, <laughs> and, you know? And I, that's why I look at it is here is this potential, this capacity, right? God formed a body, he, gave, he, he made man, but then man needed to become just like God, and now God formed into him, blew, blew the breath of life into him from his word, and now he's a living soul. He's not just, he's a spirit, he has a soul, he lives in a body, but that soul and spirit are so one, they're so joined together that you can't separate the two. Only the word of God, which created the soul, right? And, and the spirit can separate the two. And for the sake of discussion, we can separate them, but only the word, because the word formed the two, and the two came together. By, so that means if you want to have life in your soul, what do you need? Exactly. Amen. Woo. You need the word, because the word created the soul. And therefore, we need the word of God to sustain the soul and to maintain and to walk less to walk in salvation of that soul. Amen? All right. So first, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. This is a familiar scripture, but we're just laying a foundation here before we can move on. All right. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. All right. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our whole spirit, soul, and body. Man is not just psychology in a body, okay? As secular humanists teach or the world teaches, you've got psychology and such. No, we, I am, so let's all say it together. I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body. See, I'm not just a soul, I'm not a soul. I have a soul, right? I have a car. I am not a car. <laughs> I have keys to my car. I drove in my car tonight. I have a car. It belongs to me. I've paid it. It's mine. <laughs> I have title deed to it. I could drive it. <laughs> I put gas in it. I have a car, but I am not a car. Amen? Okay. So the key point right here that we want to establish is that we see here that God's design resulted in what I call a divine order. That's critical right there. A divine order of the spirit as the king ruling over the soul, which is the servant, and the body is the slave. So we want to make sure we maintain, in our discussion tonight, we want to keep this as, what's God's original intent? God's original intent was spirit, soul, and body. And we're going to see here tonight that the force of righteousness flows from the spirit, through the soul, 
into the body. Okay? It starts with the spirit. It starts with God who is a spirit and we have his word and it flows from spirit. And so the spirit needs to be the king operating through the soul, which is a servant. Okay? The soul is never meant to be the king. That's, that's, not, that's not the order. Okay? That's where people get into problems. I get into problems. You get into problems, right? You know, you, you talk with somebody and say, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm just overwhelmed. Oh, my soul. Oh. What's going on? Well, there's not, we're not walking in the salvation of the soul here because salvation of the soul will get you back into God's original divine order. There's only one person who walked the earth who never had to have the salvation of the soul, and that was Jesus. Because we're going to see tonight, he completely manifested the soul of the Father. <laughs> Right? He manifests the soul because I only do those things I see the Father do. I only say those things I say the Father, hear the Father say. He completely manifested the soul, the life, the heartbeat of the Father in everything he did. Now, we have the potential, right, to manifest that same life, that same soul, that same air, the mind, will, and the emotions that Jesus did. We have the potential, but it comes as a process of sanctification, and we're going to learn more about that. Amen? Amen. So, that's the... That's the uh, that's God's divine order. All right. So what does it mean that uh, when the Bible uses the word save or salvation? Okay, this is a familiar word. Sozo, uh, Strong's G4982, occurs over 103 times in the New Testament. In one, con- in one context, it's referred to as heal, healing, save, or saving. Okay? Uh, for example, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. And then Ephesians 2, uh, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that now of yourselves is the gift of God. So here's where we were born again, right? We began our journey. Hallelujah. Do you remember when you got saved? Yes. I do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. I heard this also from another minister of the gospel, and he said, Every day you should wake up and preach the gospel to yourself. I go, what does that mean? What are you talking about? Preach the gospel to myself. I'm already saved. He goes, you should preach the gospel to yourself and get yourself stirred up in realizing that, hey, what happened when I got saved? Right? What happened when I got saved? Which is you, you're walking in the joy of your salvation. You're not taking it for granted. You're not, you're not just saying, well, okay, I got saved. That's fine. No. What happened? Jesus became sin for me. He took it for me. He took all my shame. He took all your shame. And he became sin on the cross, and he died for me and for you, and now I am saved. Okay. When we got saved, we all know this, um, that Jesus bore our sins, but what happened? What happened, what happened on the Godward side and the manward side here? On the Godward side, we know we became new creatures in Christ. God placed us in Christ. We are encapsulated in Christ. We're hidden with Christ. Our life is in Christ. That's complete. That's instantaneous. That happened all at one point, one moment of time. We're born again. Now, we begin the process of salvation of the soul. We're starting our journey, and now we're, we're walking in the salvation of the soul. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, you know sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, this is, really, this is really critical right here. A lot of people gloss over 2 Corinthians 5.21, and we're going to touch on this a little bit later too, but we're not supposed to be, when we meditate in the word and such, we're not looking for information, we're looking for revelation. And here, when we talk about 2 Corinthians 5.21, about righteousness of God in Christ, okay, the righteousness of God in Christ, here we're looking at, you became, God's very nature is righteousness. Okay? You're a partaker of his divine nature, and now you are the righteousness of God in Christ. So where does this righteousness, righteousness is, is, is rightness with God. It flows from your spirit, from your very nature of who you are. When Jesus became sin, and then he became the firstborn from the dead, he became the righteousness of God, the first one to get born again. And now he sits in glory with righteousness. He is righteousness. Well, what do we have? We have his very own righteousness. And that righteousness, I like to think of it as the word rightness, um, and I heard a message the other day from this about this, that the force of righteousness, it's a force. Yes. It's, a for, it's an actual literal force that flows, right? And everything that's in its way gets out of the way and establishes the kingdom of God. And the force of righteousness flows, and that which is not right is now made right. I like to think of it as the force of righteousness comes in and establishes the kingdom of God in your life and sets up the divine order, 
<laughs> it causes, righteousness causes the divine order to be established in your life. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his Because he knows if you're walking in righteousness, consciousness, what's going to happen? It's going to, that divine order is going to flow from your spirit to your soul and, and, and eventually in your body and everywhere, everywhere that you go. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Another, another usage of this word sozo right here is of the present experiences of God's power to deliver from the bondage of sin. God's power to deliver from the bondage of sin. That's what we're seeing here in James 1.21, which is able to save your souls, but it has the power to save your souls. And that word is able is the Strong's G1410, which is ability to be able to have power. All right? Power in, I like this, power in action. Dunamai has the ability to save your soul. Not just, not just it, it might, it has the ability if we'll put it into practice. Okay? And this same word here, is able, is in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace. And that's a key component right here of salvation of the soul is, is the grace of God being released in your soul. Because, <clears throat> let's turn to Romans 5, 21. This is really good. This is shouting ground right here. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> went down the, went down, down the wrong way. <coughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> that as sin hath reigned in death, even so grace might reign, <clears throat> reign through righteousness. Okay, the key point I want to bring out here is what? How does grace reign? It reigns through righteousness. <clears throat> grace reigns through righteousness. Yes, we've received the abundance of grace, but how does it reign? It reigns. It has free access control, establishing the kingdom through what? Righteousness. When righteousness is present, righteousness is the foundation of the salvation of the soul. Write that down. <laughs> righteousness is the foundation. When you walk in righteousness, when you walk in who you are in Christ, when you let his life, his being flow through you from his spirit to your spirit, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that establishes the kingdom of God and it is the foundation for salvation of the soul. All right. So why do we need, I'm going to cover real quickly here, why do we need salvation of the soul? Well, we talked about our spirit got saved but salvation of the soul is progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification, right? And, <clears throat> and we're also, um, why do we need the salvation of the soul? I have, okay. Oh. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I got lots of water now. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you, sir. So why do we need salvation of the soul? Well, first of all, we're engaged in daily warfare, and the enemy is targeting our soul. Okay, targeting our soul. I think of an illustration here is I go to a target range, shooting range, gun range, okay? My, I, my wife is looking at me with that smirk. Uh, she's like, you haven't taken me yet. Um, <laughs> when we were back in Illinois, we, I went to target shooting quite a bit, um, but I need, I, I need to take my wife to go target shooting. Anyways, when you go to a, a target range, right, uh, you have your gun, and you have what they call, you can have a silhouette, like a police silhouette, where it has an image of a person, and it's like 50 yards away or something like that, and you're going over there, and you're trying to shoot at it. Okay, when you're shooting at a target range, I'm aiming at vital areas, <laughs> okay? Um, I'm not just shooting at it and just say, oh, okay, I wonder if I can hit it. No, I am specifically targeting certain areas, vital organs of that silhouette as if, in order to inflict damage, okay? That's exactly what the enemy's doing. He's not playing around, right? He knows that if he's, he's going to target, number one, he's going to target your press plate of righteousness. He's going to target your heart, your core, because if you've got condemnation, right, then you've got guilt, you, you think you deserve the punishment, and you've got guilt, and if you've got guilt, you've got shame. And if you've got shame, you're not bold. <laughs> you're not walking in fearlessness. You're not walking in who you are in Christ. You're walking around with this, oh, I deserve this punishment, and the devil puts sickness on you, and then you just accept it. Well, God's trying to teach me a lesson. No, that's not scriptural. 
God's not, te- you know, God chastens us with his word. He sent Jesus to heal you know, by his stripes we're healed. But if you're not walking in that righteousness, what's happening? You're short-circuiting the divine order. And so now the soul is trying to manage or trying to do the part or relationship or work of, of the spirit. And it was never meant for that. And now it's getting overwhelmed, and now it's processing information by what it sees and what it feels and what other people tell it, and now the soul is overwhelmed. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 6, that the, to be carnally minded is death. Yeah. It'll produce death. And now you're walking in the law of sin and death and not walking in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. All because the enemy targeted, you know, he targeted your vital organ, your heart, and short-circuited the righteousness, righteousness from your flow, and now... Now you're, now, you're, now, you're, now you're just pray. But hallelujah, we're not victims, we're victors because of what Jesus has done. All because, because of what Jesus has done for us, right? Um, one scripture here, uh, 1 Peter 2.11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Fleshly lusts war against our soul. They're trying to take us out. And the Bible admonishes us to flee youthful lusts, but to put on Jesus. Amen? Okay. Okay. Another reason why we need salvation of the soul is why? Is because the value of a human soul is, what's that MasterCard commercial? Priceless. Thank you. (laughs) The value of a human soul is priceless. There's nothing worth more than a human soul. So what did Jesus do for our souls? He shed his blood and the value, the price that he put upon our soul is his very own life. His very own life. His precious life was shed for us. And so now we, um, we value our soul. Our soul is priceless. Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall he give a man give in exchange for his soul? What can you give in exchange for your soul? Nothing. Nothing's worth more. It's worth the blood of Jesus. And then... Um, Another reason why we need salvation of soul is because it's part of our inheritance in Christ. It belongs to us. Jesus purchased it and paid for us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ when we're walking in vital union with him. I like something here that Keith Moore has taught. And he said, What God has provided by grace must be received by faith. Right? Just because it's made available to us, it's, it's given to us, that doesn't mean we automatically walk in it, okay? There's, a, there's two sides to truth here. There's, there's the vital or experiential side, and then there's also the legal or positional side. It may be available to us by grace, but we have to walk in it by faith, okay? All right, so let's define a term here. What is the salvation of the soul? It's a process of progressive sanctification in which the Holy Spirit is manifesting the grace of God, resulting in a soul wholly filled with God himself. Okay? It's progressive sanctification. It doesn't happen all at once. There's a journey. It requires the Holy Spirit to manifest the grace of God in our soul, and it results in God flooding and filling ourselves, our soul himself, with himself. We sang about tonight about holy. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the God, Right? What does that mean? Well, God is holy, but when our soul is walking in salvation, of soul is that now our soul is holy, <laughs> H-O-L-Y, or W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, filled or flooded with God himself. In essence, God is flowing from spirit, who, God is spirit, from spirit through our soul, our mind, will, emotions, and has free expression, freedom to express his will and his desire. Amen? All right. Renewing of the mind is contained within salvation of the soul. Many times we talk about renewing of the mind, and that's good, okay? But the soul consists of, of the mind, will, and emotions. And I think one of the components that we overlook a lot is, first of all, we focus on renewing the mind. Instead of looking at it, it is a part of salvation of the soul. Salvation of the soul is not just focused on the mind. Salvation of the soul is focused on the mind, the will, and the emotions. And I believe the most important part of your soul is your will. Yes. Okay? Why do I say that? Well, I'll back it up with some scripture here. <laughs> okay? But before I go into that, what is sanctification? Okay? Now, don't get all religious on me. <laughs> okay? Stay with me. Okay? Oh, wait, what was that? What did I just hear? 
I just thought I heard a moo. Was it a religious cow? <laughs> I thought I just heard a religious cow mooing. Oh, okay, maybe it was, all right. <laughs> all right. Sanctification here is just the act of being sanctified or to set apart for a sacred purpose or religious use. To free from sin, consecrate, purify. I like to look at it as to separate from and unto. I separate from one thing and unto another thing, which is really, I separate it from, from, what, from what I may be walking in apart from Christ, and now it becomes sanctified and set apart unto Christ, and it becomes holy unto him, holy used and flooded with himself. It's, it's, for, it's set apart for him. Okay? Um, I used to work, one of my first jobs um, was a walk, working as a dishwasher. <laughs> and we used to have this big, huge conveyor belt, right? And we'd have all these dishes coming through and it's big conveyor belt and it would go around and you had the little curtains over here and the dishes would be lined up and we're stacking them and, it was right, and we're putting on this conveyor belt and this thing was, was, was industrial strength, okay? You had a lot of dishes that needed to be washed. Well, it would go into this machine, this big, huge machine and then it would come out and the dishes would be really, really hot. And I remember the first time I was, I was collecting dishes on the left side and I'm, I'm collecting these dishes and they're like burning my hands. It's so hot, okay? Well, what happened to the dishes? Well, they got scrubbed, washed, and sanitized. Because before, they were dirty, unclean. They weren't fit for use. You know, I don't want to eat off someone else's plate. <laughs> okay? But now they become sanitized. They become holy, or they've become sanctified <laughs> for use by the master. Okay? And now that it's holy, it went through the process. But what happens, I think, a lot of times, though, is that people are in the process. You're on the conveyor belt. Right? You're on the conveyor belt, and you're going, ah, I don't like this, I don't like this. <laughs> and, then, and then if you can picture with me, here's this plate sprouting legs, and it goes, and it runs off the outside the conveyor belt and says, ah, it's too hot, it's too hot. <laughs> I know, it's just a, I'm just using my imagination. <laughs> but I think that's what happens a lot of times with us, right, in the process of sanctification or in the process of salvation of the soul, is we have to realize it is a process, yes. right? Okay, and let the Holy Spirit do. Man, we talked about earlier, it's a work of grace. Let the Holy Spirit do the work of grace. Many times I pray, I ask the Lord, I say, Lord, I ask for grace to endure the crucifying of my flesh. Yeah. I ask for grace right now, Lord, I realize that my flesh needs to be crucified or my soul needs to be saved, I need to walk in sanctification. Lord, I ask for grace right now to realize that you're working in me both to will, Philippians 2.13, you're both working in me both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Now, what is that to will and to good pleasure? Well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's the salvation of the soul because your will is a function of your soul and if God's working in you both to, let's turn to uh, Philippians 2.13, God's working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, Right? That is salvation of the soul when we yield to that word and let the Lord work in us with salvation of the soul, right? Um, the will is part of the soul and delighting in the will of God. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 8, it says, I delight to do thy will, O God. Your law is within my heart. Jesus said in John 4, 34, don't turn to all these scriptures, just write them down. Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Here we see Jesus expressing his will and he's saying, what's my will? He surrendered his will to do the will of the Father, and he's saying, I want to do the will of the Father, and my will is to do his will. Okay? Then um, Paul said in Romans 7, 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. What's he talking about there? He's saying, your spirit wants to do the will of God. <laughs> your spirit, the inward man, the inside, delights to do the will of God and just loves the word of God and wants to do the will of God. So what's the problem? <laughs> It's not a, <laughs> where's the break, where's the, where's the malfunction? What's the problem here? It's not a problem with the spirit. Right. It's a problem with, Houston, we have a problem where? <laughs> the soul, thank you. It's the soul, soul man, soul woman, <laughs> right? You got soul, well, okay, which, who's got you? Who's got your soul? <laughs> I should, we should say, we should, that's the question, who's got your soul? The problem, the breakdown happens in, in, in the soul because that's where the transformation. See, the Lord in his divine order set up, we said that earlier, in his divine order set up what I call connectors. The spirit is so joined with the soul that there's connectors between the two. You don't see a connector between the spirit and the body. That's not divine order. 
you see a connector between spirit and soul. Now the soul stands in the middle and is the gatekeeper, so to speak, between the soul and the body. And so now those two are connected, yes. right? And we have, to, we have to make sure that we're walking in the divine order and letting things be established in that divine order, okay? And then we'll get the fruit, we'll get the benefits of the fruits of righteousness. Right. Amen. Okay. Um, let's see here. For sake of time, let's get with that. Okay. All right. Feelings. Yes. Okay. All right. Emotions are part of the soul and such. Um, Psalm 1611, thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. All right. One of my favorite scriptures, um, Romans 15, 13. Let's turn there. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Okay? One of the effects of if you're walking in the salvation of the soul is that there should be joy and peace in believing. If you're, one of the, I like to know if something's working or not. I'm a programmer type. <laughs> I like to know how things work and how things put, put, put together and you know, all this stuff. And I like to know if there's certain indicators that am I walking, how, am I, how, how are we doing here, Lord? <laughs> what's going on here? Am I walking with you? Am I, you know, what's going on? Are there certain indicators or whatever that I can, that I can look at and say, okay? I, I remember hearing this before from a message from uh, Keith Moore. And he said, here you are driving down the road, the highway of life, and you're in your faith mobile. Okay, so picture with me right now. Use your imagination. You're driving in your favorite car or your car right now, and you're driving down the highway. Okay. There's two most important gauges on your, your faith mobile on, on the dashboard. One of them is joy, and the other one's peace. Now, not your gas gauge <laughs> or the speedometer. Those, on, this, on this faith mobile is joy and peace. You're driving along your faith mobile, and as your soul delights in the Lord and allows him to manifest the salvation of the soul, then you have the joy and peace are, are full. Okay? Yeah. All right? Now, as you keep going... You're not fueling the tank. It doesn't, get the, it doesn't get the right amount of gas. And now the joint piece are waning. The, the gauges are down. Right? And you become discouraged. You've lost hope. What is hope? Hope is joyful, confident expectation. Expectation that God is faithful to his word. That he will bring his word to pass in the midst of that situation. So now if my hope is waning, what am I becoming? I am becoming discouraged. What is discouragement? It's losing hope and letting the soul try to run the ship try to run, try to be king, and it was never designed to be king. That's a good indicator right there that the soul is out of control or trying to usurp authority, the carnal mind, over your spirit. Let's get it back in divine order. Flow with righteousness. The force of righteousness now comes back in and flows and says, your word is the word of righteousness. Your kingdom is established on righteousness. I believe what the word says, and the word is true, even irrespective of what my circumstances are telling me. I let that divine order flow through, and now things are restored back. And what manifests in the soul is joy and peace. Because the Bible says, in thy light we see, see light, and also the entrance of thy words brings light. Whenever you see Jesus, whenever you see the word, light comes, and it brings joy. <laughs> brings joy. You can't help get, but when you get a revelation of the word, you see, you see that there's joy manifested, and now you're, boom. Now your soul is, 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 is being sanctified or set apart through that process. Okay, so you're driving along, and then um, you, you come along here, and then your joint gauge is, is, is full, and peace gauge is full, and then you're driving along, and you see on the side of the road here, you see an oasis. <laughs> and you pull off the expressway, and you go to the oasis. <laughs> I had to put that in there. <laughs> So, how, real quickly here, for sake of time, how do we walk in the salvation of the soul? Well, let me, let me back up here, a, a definition. Salvation of the soul should result in a renewed mind, a surrendered will. That's key right there. A surrendered will. A surrendered will expressing itself in the obedience of faith in Christ. I'll say that again. A surrendered will expressing itself in the obedience of faith in Christ. And the hope of the gospel manifesting the emotions of joy and peace in believing. That to me is the salvation of the soul. When you have a mind that's renewed, you're walking in the mind of Christ. You have a surrendered will that expresses itself in the obedience of faith. 
And the hope of the gospel is being manifested with, with characteristic of, of joy and peace in your believing. All right, so how do we walk in salvation of the soul? Hebrews 4.12, let's turn there. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So the word created our soul, and therefore the word maintains it, and only the word can separate or divide the soul, and only the word can actually get in there and is a discerner of what's actually going on in your soul, what's actually happening, what needs to be made right. What is not right needs to be made right by letting the force of righteousness come in and push out which is not right and make it, make it right as you walk in the light. Okay? You walk in salvation of the soul by knowing your identity in Christ. And this is a key scripture here too. So, um, you know, don't just take my word for it. <laughs> take these scriptures, meditate on them for yourself, right? Prove it for yourself. But this is a key scripture here. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 Corinthians 1.30. This is one of my favorite scriptures. But of him are you where? You're in Christ Jesus. So it's available to us in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Uh, in the King James here, it says, But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I like to look at it this way. Jesus is the wisdom of God, and wisdom is always speaking. And Proverbs 4, 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. I know, because I always hear you quoting it. <laughs> wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, with all that getting, get understanding. So wisdom is always speaking. God is always speaking. He's speaking to us all the time. Just are we listening? Which is a function of the soul and mean, being submitted to the spirit. Anyways, that's another message. <laughs> um, but wisdom is always speaking, and wisdom, it says in Proverbs 8.20, this is awesome, wisdom leads in the way of righteousness. Wisdom always leads in the way of righteousness. So we need that righteousness, right? Because that's who we are, the very nature of God. And when we're walking in righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, when we're walking in righteousness, we're walking in who we are in Christ. And there's that divine order being established, which is what we want, spirit, soul, and body. Okay? So, Jesus is our wisdom. He releases the force of righteousness, which is his very nature in and through us. And what does it produce? It produces sanctification. Sanctification is holiness. That's that progressive sanctification, which is being set apart. And it's all made possible through redemption. So it's all made possible. 1 Corinthians 1.30 rests on the redemption is the foundation, and then sanctification and righteousness and wisdom of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, I gotta, I gotta wrap up here. <laughs> okay, um, the force of righteousness flowing right from our spirit. Okay, sanctified unto the Lord, and then um, Romans six thirteen. Let's look at that. Romans six thirteen. Okay, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as those that are being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. This is awesome. The last, part, the last verse I want to focus on. Your members as instruments of righteousness of God. What is he talking about here? He's not just saying stop sinning. He's saying, he's saying don't focus on the darkness. Focus on the light. Okay? You don't try to get rid of darkness in your life by focusing on the darkness. You focus on the light. Light dispels darkness. So focus on Jesus, which is the word, and it will dispel the darkness. But focus on the light, which means present the members of your body. So you present your whole body. Okay? Every part of you. Now, what's part of your body? Well, your mind, your brain, all these functions, right? Present your soul to the Lord. Present every part that you have to the Lord as what? As an instrument of righteousness. As, as we grow in this, we, we, we see that the Lord wants to use us, but we, we, we need to present ourselves to him as instruments of righteousness. Okay? What's the effect of righteousness, right? We have here, um, Romans 6.22 says, But now being made free from sin... And become service to God. You have your fruit unto holiness and peace. 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 Yeah. This is another, you know, joy and peace. Yeah. There's that gauge. You can tell if it's something, if you're walking in the peace of God, it's because Isaiah 32, 17 says, and the effect of righteousness will be peace. And I love this word peace here because it's uh, Strong's 1515 in irony. It's peace or rest, absence or end of strife. Okay? All right. 
The strife is over. Here's another key point. The strife is over. Now God's divine order has been restored as we walk in the salvation of the soul. Okay? The strife is over. There's no more war. Remember we talked about earlier about your flesh, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul? Well, the war is over. Jesus already conquered and defeated the enemy for us, but personally, experientially, it becomes a part of us, what we walk in progressively as we walk in it by faith. Remember, what's been provided by grace has to be received by faith. You become a partaker of his divine nature, and that affects your soul. But now you become a partaker and are walking in his peace. Yes. Amen. Okay. All right. Okay, I'll skip over that section. <laughs> so I want to finish up quickly here. Okay, um, in Jesus, we see the express image of God manifesting the divine order of spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Jesus is completely manifesting the soul of the Father. Let's look at our, our original verse here that we, can't, we talked about at the beginning, which is 1 Peter 1.9. Let's turn there. 1 Peter 1.9. Okay. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. This is awesome. The end of your faith. What's he talking about here? The end of something. Well, that word end is a strong uh, word, uh, telos. It means to set out for a definite point or goal, that by which a thing is finished, it's close. The end to which all things relate is aim or purpose. Okay? The end of something, the, co- the goal. All right? Now, my boys are going to like this illustration. Um, I think of Tony Stark in Iron Man. <laughs> okay? This is just for you boys. Um, I think of Tony Stark... When he wants to suit up, what happens? He steps, now he's got this platform, right? But he gets all these components, right? And he becomes Iron Man, right? Who he puts on his armor, but he suits up, okay? The end or the goal was Tony Stark wanted to become something that he was not. Now he becomes Iron Man. The process, the end of that, of that suiting up, was not just so that he has knowledge about Iron Man. No, he has become Iron Man, and now he has the power and the ability of an Iron Man walking in. Okay? The end or goal of him him suiting up was to become just like Iron Man. Okay? The end here or the goal of salvation of the soul is what? Receiving the end of our faith is just. It's just like what? It's just like Jesus. It's walking in who we are in him and letting him manifest his, that divine order that he has given to us that we have in Christ. Amen? And then just one other thing for the boys here. Um, who did Tony Stark usually talk to when he's inside the suit? Jarvis. Jarvis, thank you, sir. All right? Well, we have someone even much better. Uh, well, in, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Iron Man, he's talking to Jarvis, okay? And Jarvis is saying all these different things to him and telling him to do this and blah, 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 and or such. He's helping him operate in the suit, okay? Well, we have someone who's much, much, much greater than Jarvis. We have the Holy Spirit, and he helps us operate in the suit. (laughs) He speaks to us and shows us how to. He leads us and guides us into all truth. He leads us and guides us into the word of righteousness, and he leads us and guides us into salvation of the soul. Amen? And then one last quick uh, thing. I'm going to put in a shameless plug, and I'm I'm unashamed about this. (laughs) Uh, All right. Uh, back in uh, April, Mr. Barbara mentioned to me about the Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice book. Um, it's an awesome book, and in it, I don't have time to cover it tonight, but in it, there's a whole section here that deals with meditation in the Word of God, and it deals with transferring logos to rhema. Um, that's one of the ways we can help uh, walk in salvation of the soul. Um, and just to suffice to say, for meditation, meditation is not about information, it's about revelation. When you see Him... That's meditation, okay? Because meditation will bring, when you see Jesus, then you get the revelation of who he is. And who does that? The Holy Spirit. You can study, I mean, you can study the Bible. You can study till your eyes become like raisins. (laughs) You can study and study and study, and you won't get anything out of it. All you do is acquire knowledge, information. Unless the Holy Spirit turns the light on, right? Unless he turns the light on, then you don't have any revelation. And so that's what we want with it tonight, okay? So the scriptures I shared with you and other, other points and stuff like that, we cover, talk about salvation. So I want you, you know, I encourage you, seek the Holy Spirit. Don't just take my word for it, but seek him and get the revelation of, of, of what it means to walk in the salvation of the soul. Amen? Okay. All right. Um, do we have anyone here 
this may be your first time, um, 